hear me? Hope so. Hi, uh, Good to see you all still here. Uh, I know this is our last talk of, uh, of the day, and everybody's anxious to get uh, for beers, so uh, mm -hmm. trying to make it uh, probably uh, <laughs> as, as quick as possible, but at the same time, I'm not skipping anything. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's good to be here back in, uh, in Belgium uh, at Fosdem. I uh, can't believe it's already a year though. So, uh, better get it started. Uh, my name is Mark Belts. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, custom CentOS AMI builds on AWS infrastructure. So, just before we start, how many of you have heard or used AWS? Nice. So, how many of you uh, are familiar with AMIs or heard them? Okay, that's what's right. too good. All right, uh, just to get my bearings around uh, how much into detail uh, I need to get. So, I'm first going to start uh, talking about me. I guess I'm really good. Um, <laughs> like that. So, just a couple of words about myself. Um, work as a senior IT consultant at Scare Factory. We are a London based uh, a cloud consultancy. We're just a little bit over 20 people. Uh, I have a really extensive uh, kind of uh, experience and background in Linux and virtualization. Uh, I'm also an open source contributor and supporter. Uh, definitely uh, very passionate about automation and uh, simplifying things. Uh, also hold a couple of certificates and uh, you know competencies in AWS, uh, CK, of course, because that's popular nowadays. Everybody does Kubernetes. Uh, and of course, uh, Red Hat. Um, as I mentioned, I was hiking, tracking, traveling, exploring new things. Probably that's why I'm in Brussels, uh, <laughs> exploring new stuff. So, to continue. So, what the agenda would look like is uh, we're going to kick it off with a little bit about AMIs, uh, what are they, how to use it, uh, why do we want to use it actually. Uh, then we're going to progress with some background on motivation, why we decided to build our own AMIs, specifically why we want to customize them. Uh, then afterwards, we're going to look at the process of building your AMI, how that looks like, uh, what does it involve. And I'm going to talk a little bit afterwards about our solution or what tools we use to achieve that uh, in a way that we did and you know, uh, how, it, how it looks like and comes together. And uh, just before we conclude, I will try to do a demo. Uh, I hope that uh, the demo gods are happy today. So, uh, uh, fingers crossed everything will work. Um, I have tried it before, so it should be good. And yep, yeah, uh, we're just gonna wrap it up with a couple of conclusions and I'll let you go for beers. Um, the crowd, you're really uh, struggling to get So. Let's get started then. Uh, first, what is an AMI? So uh, it's actually exactly what it says on the tin. It's a machine image, uh, specifically because in the AMI it stands for uh, Amazon's uh, machine image. Uh, as you all were aware, we are uh, we know a lot of different kind of uh, formats of machine images. For example, we know uh, for uh, in Amazon you would have AMIs, that's a, a EC2 kind of type of machine image. Uh, then for uh, VMware, uh, you would have uh, VMDK or VMX files, that's another kind of type of uh, machine images you can have, or OFF exports for VirtualBox, etc. You can have raw images for KVM, um, so different kind of images you can operate with. Um, so, uh, in, M uh, in Amazon, AMI is basically just, uh, basically it actually is a template for the root volume of instance, so it's basically just a snapshot of the root volume that you're using or spinning your machine from. Uh, so, I'm not sure if you can see the, the image though, but the life cycle of an AMI actually starts either with you create your own MI or you use the ones that are already available in either uh, uh, Amazon MarketSpace or public available ones that have been published uh, and have been granted for public use. For example, those are the ones that you can uh, get CentOS images from. So, uh, sadly, there is no CentOS 8 AMI yet available, right? It, it was built, 
And okay. it's uh, because you know if you want to be a marketplace, they have to be uh, checked by Amazon. And right. It was sent to them, so you can import the one we built. Right. But if you want to, to see it in marketplace, it's already on their side, and we are just waiting for okay. them to publish it. No worries. I guess I actually wanted to demo with CentOS 8 because this is the latest version. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, available. The, the base image wasn't available, so I will kind of try to demonstrate how to build your own if you don't have the base available yeah. beforehand. So, um, Hopefully soon, trademark, but... Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be soon though. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Cheers. So, uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, either you uh, use the one that's already available or you build your own. Um, so that means building from scratch, I guess. Um, there are a couple of methods I will mention later on. Uh, and after you build your own, uh, own MI, of course, you want to either share it with others or disseminate using the market ecosystem or just make it publicly available. So you don't actually have to use the market ecosystem of Amazon if you don't want to. Just You can just mark it as public. And that actually makes it available to all users in Amazon ecospace. And after you're done with it, the last thing you probably want to do or you, you know, if you want to clean up your environment is the richer string it and, of course, clean up the all remaining snapshots that you have left. So, what would be the motivation for creating an IMI? So, either you can think of system hardening or you want to uh, apply the latest OS patches because obviously uh, the you know, um, uh, Linux vendors probably wouldn't uh, create MI images very often or doesn't it actually doesn't actually make sense to create them very often for vendors but you probably want to end up with the AMI that's patched to the latest patches. Uh, you can have the configuration management bootstrapping set in. This means that, for example, if uh, you have a system in place that automatically provisions your uh, instances, you probably want them uh, one instance to be bootstrapped so they automatically connect to your uh, maybe your mini system or perhaps Puppet server or Chef server or whatever you use for the configuration management. Uh, on that note. You would probably want to have quick instance pinups that's connected to the patching of the instance and probably avoiding all the unnecessary configuration you would need to do during the initial bootup. And of course, other customizations as well. Uh, I'm mentioning the Ready Scale platform here. Uh, as I mentioned, we are a uh, consultancy from London. We are delivering our own platform uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, smaller or uh, startup companies that are trying to get on board as the cloud. So I will just do a brief kind of a overview of that platform so you get a uh, kind of a idea why we actually ended up creating our own AMIs. So what the Ready Scale platform actually offers is in very high level. It offers you a, a configuration management out of the box that is automatically picked up from GitHub repo. Sorry, Git repo, it doesn't have to be GitHub. It can be any kind of Git repo, it can be GitLab. For the sake of the demo later on, uh, I put it in GitLab just to demonstrate that you know you can use any kind of uh, thing for uh, for the solution we are uh, presenting now. Uh, you would ha you would have deployed the CI/CD system for deploying uh, your package builds or configuration management as well. Uh, there is an archi archi architectural change that you can do via the Terraform apply and uh, planning, and of course there is a central uh, LDAP server uh, available for authenticating users and a VPN service that allows users to connect to the system and use the uh, services. So why we wanted to, I mean, why we actually ended up building our own custom AMI is because, for example, we want uh, our instances to be bootstrapped so they are uh, avail uh, aware of the system that they're being spun up and they're automatically connected to the uh, Puppet Master and being automatically provisioned and configured in the way that, uh, for example, the, in the higher level, uh, we would assign roles to instances. So, for example, you can have an instance with the role web server and it will automatically be provisioned with all the necessary tools and services for, for hosting a, a website or, I don't know, maybe a Ruby on Rails website even. It doesn't really matter. So, moving on. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the ecosystem and tools that we use. Um, just remember, though, if there are any other questions, there will be time for questions at the end of the, this session, but 
if I'm going too fast, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions during the, the talk as well. Uh, so our platform is based on uh, CentOS uh, uh, as a runtime and a build OS. So uh, we are uh, completely a platform we used to support Ubuntu as well, but since most of our customer base were kind of uh, leaning towards CentOS or Red Hat, uh, because it seems to have like a longer support period than other competitive uh, distributions, uh, we just dropped the support for uh, Ubuntu and just had to send us. Uh, for creating an IMI, we are using uh, HashiCorp's Packer. Uh, is anybody familiar with Packer? Probably with Fabian. Oh, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, because we are a DevOps consultancy, you want to have your infrastructure uh, tested before you deploy it. So we are using uh, Kitchen Test Suite uh, with GOS testing for AMIs. So this means uh, that after we uh, create an IMI, we spin it up, we uh, run a couple of, uh, let's say, uh, several spec packs on it, so we are sure that the, the image that was built actually would be usable and actually can be used as an image that's part of our platform. Um, as I was preparing for the for the for this talk, I actually noticed that there is also a native provisioner uh, in Packer that you can use, so you don't actually have to use Kitchen Suite, with, with, which has its downsides. For example, you would need to use um, uh, a lot of Ruby gems I've to tried to run it up, which can be quite a bit annoying, specifically with cementing, burgeoning, and dependencies that usually are quite annoying uh, if you're familiar with the Ruby ecosystem. Uh, so there is a native provision that you can use that's automatically uh, kicked off as a part of uh, post-provisioning uh, part of the build uh, manifest. Uh, it was actually Supported by a Yale University, and I've attached a GitHub link here. So if anybody's interested, you can have it a go. I think that I'm actually going to try to give it a go after after a couple of weeks as well, because I think it's a much neater solution than having a being dependent of any other kind of uh, third-party tooling or different tool set that you would nat natively use by uh, by uh, Packer. So. Uh, that's actually the reason why we're also using AWS CLI in, in our CI environment as well, because we have to manually create SSH keys that are temporarily used for the kitchen test suite, which is actually not used if we are using the, the packer itself, because it automatically knows how to you know, create uh, SSH keys and uh, use those keys while provisioning the image or testing the image at the end of it. Um, the code is, of course, stored in uh, any kind of uh, Git repo that you can access. We are triggering pipelines uh, on push events, so whenever you push to, to your Git repo, it automatically kicks off your pipeline for building the AMI or testing it afterwards. Uh, we also get slack notifications after the dispatch is done. And, of course, AMI is uh, automatically published and marked as uh, public because uh, uh, this is the way how we actually provision AMIs to our customers is we mark it as public and the customer actually copies the AMI into their system and on the fly it's actually encrypted with their uh, private uh, keys so uh, they're completely safe in a way that they have secrets and storage encrypted uh, uh, um, as the image is copied and uh, at rest as well as they use the platform. So. Uh, Building a custom AMI, um, as I mentioned, it's basically just a machine image. It's a single static unit that contains a pre-configured operating system and uh, all the software that you would need for that uh, instance or VM, uh, as you can call it if you wish. Uh, uh, so, as I mentioned, you can either have them based on existing AMIs, so you can use the CentOS images and just, you know, uh, configure it later on as you provision the instances, but that usually means longer, longer provisioning times and probably it's not as, uh, um, as convenient as you would need to add different kind of uh, things into the image later on. Uh, if you're working with the Amazon ecosystem, you can use the EC2 image builder. This is the new thing they have announced a couple of months ago. Uh, it has its limitations, basically means that there are only a certain set of uh, OSs that are supported. I think they're only supporting um, 
uh, Amazon Linux uh, uh, and Windows systems, so uh, no CentOS just yet. Uh, so you're either left of using the existing one or uh, you can do on the VM import. So there are two phases if you do that. You need to locally build your VM, uh, um, add all the customizations in, and then just use the, the, the import procedure to import your VM into the Amazon as a snapshot and then create that AMI from that. Or, of course, you can do it your own from scratch, as we will see in, <laughs> in the presentation later on how we actually did it. And I'm sure uh, you're doing it the same way, though. <laughs> um, at the moment, we just do the um, rebuild locally to right. our build pipeline. Okay. We just uh, VM import to test, and then they have, okay. uh, Amazon has the artifact to just take it from there and then do the marketplace thing. Okay. So you're not actually building it in the Amazon? No, no, no. no. Okay. No, no. Okay. Which is why I'm, I'm, I'm there up just to, to listen to you. Okay. <laughs> Glad to hear that, actually, because this is actually our one of our kind of wishes or requirements before we started this. We wanted to completely build the machine in the AWS and not be dependent on any kind of CI CD system or uh, external system that you might have for building the VM. Um, so let's just go real quickly over the kind of high level uh, MI build uh, procedure uh, architecture. So you have your code live in Git repo uh, and push to your uh, master branch. Usually you would kick off the build. After the build is successfully finished, you would kick off usually testing. All is done within the CICD system. And after the test is complete, if it's successful, you would probably release it. Or maybe you can have a manual step to uh, release it manually uh, if you wish. But uh, we decided that if tests are successful, we're happy to release it automatically. That's fine with us. Uh, we're happy with that. Uh, and then at the end, you would probably want to have a notification that the image was built. Or if, even if it failed, that you would know that something happened with that CICD pipeline uh, at the end of it. So uh, either it was successful or um, it failed and you need to take care of it and have an additional look of it. Uh, so let's just go through those phases and I will start with the automation pipelines. As I mentioned, uh, we are using pipelines to automate the, the deployment process. When we started, we were using Jenkins. Um, probably many of you use, use Jenkins in the past, so you know what, what, what you have to deal with if you're using Jenkins, probably. The, the least popular CI CD system nowadays, specifically when everybody's moving to uh, containers in the cloud. But still, uh, it's definitely serving its purpose. It, I think it's actually a good system, very open system, but it's really hard to manage. I think the, 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 the maintenance hours that we put in, we're not even going to get back, so <laughs> it's how it is. So, uh, after a while, we migrated to GitHub Actions. Uh, as I mentioned for the demo later on, I'm going to use GitHub uh, just to uh, um, just to show you that it can be any kind of a CI/CD system uh, in any kind of either hosted or locally hosted uh, environment. Uh, so I think that the, the advantage of using this kind of system is that you can use containers as built images, so you don't have to you know uh, prepare your uh, provision your build infrastructure manually, so you can just package a container and use it as a build environment when you're using either a GitHub Actions or a GitLab or a CI/CD system. Uh, configuration stored is YAML, because everybody loves YAML, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess in a couple of years we all be just doing YAML, right? Of course. <laughs> uh, and store our data in JSON. That or that. Uh, uh, the visibility you get from that is quite good as well because uh, everything is kind of part of this uh, Git repo. So, for example, if you're using uh, GitHub Actions, you would immediately get feedback in your uh, their PRs or branches, what happened with your uh, pipelines. You don't have to take care of uh, the integration for an external CD system, which is kind of nice as well. Uh, and the feedback loop is very short, as I mentioned, uh, as a result of that. And of course, you also want to have reproducible artifacts and uh, reproducible infrastructure on the top of it as well. So, I'm not sure if you can see that, 
but it's just basically I give that CI YAML configuration file. The thing I wanted to point out is uh, you can create your pipeline quite simple in, in the configuration file. Uh, the things that are uh, kind of um, important for here, I'm just going to open it a little bit here. So the things that are Keep pressing the button for quite a while and then it. Hello. Just gonna stand it, it's fine. Uh, so the bits that are important there are actually um, are actually bits that consider the build stage. Uh, if you look at the end of the uh, end of the uh, YAML file, there is a stage called build, and we are just executing a script for uh, uh, we are actually triggering the make file target that's called build that you know take care of everything, I'm going to show you that later on in the demo, but for the sake of it, uh, we are uh, building the AMI and afterwards we are ingesting the output that is a manifest of JSON that Packer produces and using it as an input for the testing phase because the, the output from the first phase actually gives us the AMI ID that we need to specify for the next phase. Uh, we also need to specify the security group so the, 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 our test suite can actually access the infrastructure. Um, of course, the security group is fake, so um, um, we're not revealing any information there. Moving on to building, uh, building images using Packer. As I mentioned, uh, HashiCorp Packer, we find it as a very good choice for doing that job. I think it's one of the best tools out there, at least the open source tools. Uh, there are alternatives, but I think this one actually checks the most boxes there in a way that, you know, it's open, very mature, extensible as well. There are a lot of builders that are supported, not just for AWS, also for different kind of uh, cloud vendors or uh, different kind of VMs or uh, containerization platforms that you want to support. And it's portable as well. Uh, some features and attributes I would like to kind of point here is it kind of integrates very well with the CI/CD system. Uh, as I mentioned, it has a wide range of builders plugins that you can use. And one specifically interesting thing is you can do parallel builds as well, which is kind of useful if you're doing parallel builds from multiple platforms or, for example, if you want to produce, a, let's say, for example, like Vagrom box at the end of the stage as well. Of course, the configuration is structured, uh, quite simple, lightweight and performant. And as I mentioned, other alternatives are usually more opinionated how, uh, and less pluggable, how they are kind of uh, building images in a sense. Uh, this might be a little bit bigger, so the bit that I'm trying to, to kind of show you here is uh, we are using a so-called EBS uh, surrogate uh, AWS builder. Uh, I think it's the advanced node of building the AMI uh, and how it actually does the thing is it takes the source AMI, this is the AMI that's used for, it can be any kind of AMI, but if you're building CentOS system, uh, it definitely makes it, makes it much easier if you use either CentOS or Red Hat AMI as a source, uh, because as you will see later on, um, uh, how you actually build your AMI is you bring up the uh, 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 change root environment that, uh, within which you actually build your system upon and then detaching the EBS volume that you're using and using that as a base for the uh, snapshot for your MI that you're building. Uh, so, as I mentioned, since there was no uh, CentOS 8, I use uh, Red Hat 8.1 for, for my demo, which proved to be quite easy to adopt since uh, the, uh, the drift between Red Hat and CentOS is fairly small and the packages are almost 100% compliant. Uh, for the second part of the build JSON file, uh, as I mentioned, either is CMO or JSON. So, uh, but for the second part, I just want to highlight here that you would have uh, different kind of provisioner phases here. The important bit is the last bit where we are actually copying in the build uh, script and running that build script with some parameters here. For example, we are passing in the device name that we are attaching as a change root device that we're going to use and a build directory that where all the build artifacts are stored so we can pull in some um, additional uh, artifacts that we need for building the AMI. Um, the build script is actually not anything 
special really uh, the bit that is probably the most important is uh, how you actually start doing stuff uh, initially you just initialize the, the, the RPM database this is the first thing you need to do uh, so that's uh, the reason for that is this is the base for installing any other additional packages that you want to add to your AMI later on so uh, it's basically just you know uh, assembling your um, your uh, distribution from the scratch. So the first thing you do, you add uh, GPG keys, some CentOS repos, and then you uh, fire up the, the CentOS release image, which gives you the, the, the kind of a base skeleton, and afterwards you kick off with additional packages that you might want to install as well if you're AMI image. Uh, so when your AMI is built, of course you want to test it as I mentioned, and uh, we decided we want to use GOS. Uh, are people familiar with GOS testing suite? Some of them, yeah. At least one person. <laughs> uh, so just shortly about GOS. It's an open source uh, testing suite written in Golang, which kind of makes it nice and um, actually uh, quite portable to different kind of platforms. It has its limitation at this point, as I will mention later. They are only supporting Linux-related uh, packages and services. That doesn't mean the package cannot be transcompiled to other systems. It just can test Linux systems. As as I was preparing this um, presentation, I'm sure they're going to expand at some point if there will be interest in the community. Uh, so how it actually works, of course, it takes YAML as a configuration file. What else? Um, it's based on server spec, so it's kind of a server spec alternative. If you're familiar with the server spec testing, this is similar, but it doesn't use Ruby or any kind of other derivatives, so it's just a simple, uh, single um, binary that you can use, and you just need, it, you need to provide it with the configuration YAML file, and it will just go off and start testing, which is kind of useful. Uh, as I mentioned, it's quite fast, uh, and it has a Surprisingly small footprint because usually go like, like uh, binaries we usually have a quite big footprint, but this one is relatively small. I think it's in the range of about 10 megabytes, which is kind of I think uh, acceptable if you think that connectivity is. I mean, uh, bandwidth is supposed to be cheap nowadays, so uh, it's not that bad. I'm just going to show you quickly how our GOS testing suit looks like, uh, specifically the configuration file. Uh, yeah, note to myself, I uh, need to uh, split the, the YAML files in more slides next time so it, you can actually see what it says. Uh, so there are a couple of basic elements that you can test in GOS. So for example, you can test for files, you can test for users, processes, ports. Uh, so, for example, if you want to test for files or directories, you can check if the file exists, what most mode has it set, what the ownership is, uh, even the contents of file can be checked as well. So, for example, if you if you if you, okay, you can see my mouse there. So, if you look, for example, in the bootstrap uh, file there in the uh, temp folder, uh, we are checking if it exists and if it contains the bootstrap uh, content, which is just a. Uh, uh, Ex um, example there how it would be used for the content. So you can also check if the users are created on the system, for example, like EC2 user, uh, what its uh, IDs are, uh, what groups does it belong to, and of course, uh, what processes are running, and um, if there are open ports in the machine, and if you move forward, um, you can also check what, if you have specific packages installed, but what versions they're on. Uh, you can check the connectivity out, uh, you know, toward the internet. For example, you can check if the instance has access to the Google to port 22 or 443, for example, which is kind of useful as well. If you need to check that your maybe firewall or routing tables are set correctly, um, you can um, check if the commands are returning specific outputs. For example, you want to check if the pip is installed in the specific version. And of course, you can check uh, the, the, the exit status as well. And of course, 
last but not the least, you can check what mount points are present and uh, what type of mount points are or what kind of file systems are, are, are mounted underneath. Okay. So this kind of concludes the, let's say, the, the less interesting bit. Uh, so I'm just going to switch to demo now. Seeing what you're seeing, just want to just do, uh, just bear with me for a bit. I'm just gonna mirror my screen. Terminal here. So can you oh, probably you cannot read this. So I'm going to make it a bit bigger. Okay. So it looks, looks a bit better. This doesn't look really better, but I think I know what the reason is for that. Um, um, sorry for that. Um, change the resolution a bit because I work on this there. As I mentioned before, we have the, the build script, which is called build.sh. If we look at this one quickly, as I mentioned, it's just a bash script. The important bit is the, 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 the release variable, which specifies the, um, the URL of the CentOS release that we want to use. So we're going to go with the CentOS 8.1. Uh, I was actually lucky this release before I started preparing for my presentation, so um, fine. that actually worked quite well. Uh, then um, we'll have just build a couple of arrays there in Bash, nothing too fancy. Uh, next thing we want to do is partition our EBS volume there. Uh, we are using parses for that. Uh, and um, we're using predefined part configuration, I'm going to show later on. Uh, what it does, it actually just partitions our uh, EBS volume that we're attaching. And, uh, it's formatting the partitions with the file systems that we wanted to have, and we are mounting AS as a secondary root FS we're going to use to change root to. We also bring up swap space. Um, this is probably optional because if you're deploying, um, for example, like uh, instances for Kubernetes cluster, uh, swap is not uh, not uh, desired anymore, obviously. So you can skip that as well. So the next thing is the bit that I showed you before. Uh, what we're doing here, we are initializing the RPM database. We are uh, uh, installing the keys uh, first, and then we are installing uh, CentOS repos. You will notice that this is still done on the temporary system that we bring up, uh, and it's not actually done in the change root environment. So this is just because we need access to CentOS repos in order to proceed forward. And as you can see here, uh, we are starting installing base system in the in the root FS that we mounted on the secondary EBS volume. So we are just uh, here. We're just using the the, the repos from the base system that's temporary and pushing things into the root file system. And uh, at this point, we are just installing the core group. It's just going to end up with a kind of a minimal install of CentOS. Uh, we are also adding uh, repos as well, and then there are some... Questions now or later? Yeah, you can interrupt me here. What is the size of the uh, volume that you're building?